Greetings, everyone. My name is Oscar Cruz. I am a program assistant at the Wilson Center's Latin American program. This month, the Wilson Center is honoring the deep-rooted history, the vibrant culture, and the innumerable contributions of Hispanic Americans to the United States. I am honored to be joined by award-winning journalist Marielena Salinas. She is the most recognized Hispanic female journalist in the United States and has been regarded as the voice of Hispanic America by the New York Times. For over three decades, she was the co-anchor of Univision's Noticiero Univision in Aquí y Ahora. Maria Elena has interviewed numerous U.S. presidents, Latin American heads of state, dictators, and rebel leaders. In 2007, she made history by co-hosting both the first ever Democratic and Republican candidate presidential debates in Spanish on the Univision network. Currently, she is a contributor at CBS News. Throughout the years, Marilena has used her visibility to encourage Hispanic Americans to engage in the political and civic process of this nation. Her work for Jazz Ora, a national civic engagement campaign that promotes Hispanic participation in U.S. politics, has been recognized with a Peabody Award. Marilena Salinas also launched a scholarship to support young Hispanic Americans interested in pursuing a career in media. She's one of the funding members of the National Association of Hispanic Journalists and sits on the board of the Hispanic Scholarship Fund. Marilena, many thanks for joining us. Gracias por acompañarnos. Un placer estar contigo, Oscar. I want to start this conversation by asking, what does Hispanic Heritage Month mean to you and why it is so important that we celebrate it? You know, Hispanic Heritage Month really is a, a month of celebration for me. Although I'm probably not the only one that will say this, but we would hope that we celebrate Hispanic heritage all year round and not only during one month. But nevertheless, we're happy to have this month. It started off as a week and then it was extended as to a month. But this is an opportunity, I think, for, for us to celebrate our heritage, to celebrate all the accomplishments that we have had in the Latino community, uh, to introduce some of our heroes and sheroes that maybe some people might not know about, not only to our young people, in, in our community, but also to the rest of the country. So, you know, sometimes people say, well, is this a time to talk about immigration? No, Hispanic Heritage Month is a celebration and there is so much to celebrate in our community. So, so it's a special month for me. It always has been because even though I was born in the U.S., I think that I've always felt that pride in my cultural heritage. That's how I grew up. I grew up bilingual, um, you know, bicultural, and it's something that I have embraced since I was a little girl. You were born in Los Angeles to middle-class Mexican parents, moved to Mexico where you lived for eight years, and then returned to Los Angeles when you were nine years old. How did your binational and bicultural background help you find your passion for journalism and the issues that you have advocated for throughout your career? Well, you know, it's interesting because when I started working at Channel 34 in Los Angeles back in 1981, it, it wasn't my idea to be on television. I didn't really, you know, going there wanting to be a journalist, I had studied marketing and I really thought that, you know, that, uh, this was an opportunity for, for me to get into the sales department and work in the advertising part of the business. I had worked in radio before, but when I started working and I was put on the air uh, almost immediately with no experience, you know, I became very passionate. I wanted to make sure that I did my job to the best of my abilities. Uh, I, I had to go back to school at nights and weekends and, and learn on the job, but also learn the trade a, a little bit better. But I think during this process, especially in the first year, I realized the need that there was in our community. And how did my upbringing influence it and, and help it, I, I must say also? Because I always felt that I was reporting to a community that I was part of. I was also the daughter of Mexican immigrants. I also came from a working class family. My family faced a lot of the issues and problems and adjustments that, you know, that, that many of the immigrants that I was, that we were reporting to had. My mother, her English was not a, very good. My father spoke six languages. So, you know, not only did he speak English and Spanish, but several other languages. So I think I could relate to the needs uh, of our community. Um, and I, and I really think that early on, you know, there were only, what, 14 million Latinos at the time in the country, and now there's 62 million, according to the last census count, which I think is probably, you know, lower than, than what it should be because a lot of people didn't participate in the census. But you can see just how much we've grown and how much our interest has, has grown um, as a community. But back then, really, I think 
I learned early on that our job was going to be beyond reporting, that we needed to inform and empower a community that needed how to get along into what many, many was their newly adopted country. In the early 80s, you were a young journalist at KMEX, Channel 34, uh, the first Spanish TV station in Los Angeles and the second in the United States. In your memoir, you dedicate several pages to narrate the district elections of 1983. Can you share with us what happened to you while covering this local election and why it was so consequential to your lifelong efforts of encouraging Hispanic Americans to participate in the political process of this nation? Yeah. I remember that clearly. In fact, just a few days ago, I spoke about this incident because it really did mark um, I think what my mission was eventually going to be as a journalist, I know some people call it advocacy journalism as if it were a bad word, but, but it's not that we are advocating, you know, for any specific uh, party or for any specific, uh, you know, loss or anything like that. It's, it's advocating to make sure that the Latino community is take, is not taken for granted. And in order for them not to be taken for granted, they have to participate. So the incident that you mentioned, well, we were uh, maybe 25% of the population in Los Angeles at the time. Now, I think it's over 50%. But we didn't have any political representation at any level, not on the Board of Education, not on the Board of Supervisors, not in City Hall. It, we had zero political representation. So when there was an opportunity for the City Council to bring in a new person, there was, there was a slot that was open, a seat that was open, and there was a Latino running for that seat, I went out to do my story. I went out to do what they call man on the street, which means you just interview people on the street and ask them for their opinion or who they're going to vote for or, or what do they think of the election. And when I came back um, to my newsroom, I told my news director, Pete Moraga, um, I can't do the story. He said, why can't you do the story? I said, because out of 16 people I interviewed, 15 weren't voting. And they weren't voting either because they didn't know there was an election. They weren't informed. They weren't registered. They, they didn't qualify to vote. They were not, not involved at all. And, and my boss told me, you know, can't you see it? You have your story right there in front of you. Um, Latinos uh, do not have political representation because they're not participating themselves. They feel so disenfranchised from mainstream America, that they're just not participating. And I think, you know, not only was that a good journalistic lesson for me, you got to, you know, look beyond uh, to see what the story is. But I think it also taught me that, as I said before, part of my job was going to be empowering the Latino community, not just the political empowerment of the Latino community, but empowerment through information, through education, uh, through motivation. So um, I think that's what, it, it became my passion, and it also then became my mission. So that's why ever since then, every time there's an election cycle coming around, which we actually should be doing this, uh, you know, all year round, all the time, uh, I, I usually go out to motivate people, Latinos, either to become citizens, to register to vote, and to vote. I don't tell them who to vote for. And I say it all the time, vote por quien quiera, pero vote, which means vote for whoever you want to, but make sure that you vote. Because... The, the strength is in numbers. And if we're not turning out to vote, that's when elected officials start taking us for granted. They say, well, they're not going to vote anyway. So why should we take the time to look at their issues, to address the issues that affect the Latino community? That's why it's so important to do it in numbers. And, and it's incredible just how much Latino vote has grown. There were more than 31 million eligible Latinos to vote in 2020. And that is the largest minority group. Or you can also say that it's the second largest voting bloc in the country. So, you know, not only are we the largest minority, but we're, we're also the largest uh, voting, non-white voting bloc, let's say. And, and when I say non-white, and it, it's interesting because, you know, we've been having this debate and we're having this debate now in, in Hispanic Heritage Month is the definition of race and, and the definition of ethnicity there's not enough boxes out there to cross out, to define who we are. Uh, some of us are white. Some of us are brown. Some of us are black. Some of us, you know, uh, are multi-ethnic uh, and multicultural. So it's very hard to put us in a box. I think that the Latino community is probably the most diverse community in the country right now. 
Throughout your career, you have covered elections, natural disasters, and armed conflicts across the hemisphere. But you have also closely covered what you describe as one of the most dynamic stories of your generation, and that is the explosive growth of Hispanic Americans in the United States. When you began your career in television, there were 14 million Hispanic Americans in this country. Today, there are over 60 million. From your perspective, in what ways has this population shift transformed the U.S., local economies, and especially the communications industry? Right. Well, we haven't only grown in numbers. I think we've grown in influence. And we've grown in, in, in influence and, and in, in the contributions that we make across the board to the economy. I mean, just the, the purchasing power of Latinos is $1.7 trillion. Uh, we're workers. We're voters. We are taxpayers. Um, we, we're business owners. In, in fact, 86% of, of the businesses, uh, of new businesses, is, is made up of a, from a Latino. And also an interesting number is that 86% of new jobs uh, that have been created have been created by the Latino since the Great Depression. So we have a big impact in business, in culture. I mean, our culture, it's seen everywhere in, in, in the food that we eat and the music that we listen to. Our roots are so deep in the United States. And, and now we're not just talking about what it was like when I started working in television versus now. I think it's always been that way. I mean, you see the names of the, of the cities that we live in, the names of the streets. You could see just how embedded our culture is. We have to remember that Spanish was spoken in the U.S. before English was spoken. So our roots are really, really, really deep. So even though we have grown so much and, and, and we have uh, been able to, to, to gain you know, uh, some political power, it's still not enough. We don't have the representation that, that we need to have in, in, in the business world, in the media, in, in you know, in, in government, in so many things, because unfortunately, it seems that in spite of those roots that I mentioned to you being so deep, sometimes we're treated and perceived as if we were foreigners in our own country, which is really strange because out of the 60, 62 million Latinos that live in the country, 86% are U.S. citizens or legal residents. At least 60% are U.S. born. So the growth in the Latino community is not from immigration. In fact, immigration has decreased in the past years, in the past decade. It's births. And we have a very young community. So when we think of the future, and I was reading a magazine the other day that had a, a perfect headline it was, uh, I think it was Elle Magazine. It was dedicated to Hispanic Heritage Month. And there was one page that said, the future is Latinx. And, and I said, you know what? It's so true. Because, you know, it seems like we pressure young people sometimes to say, you know, the future of this country is in your hands. And they feel the pressure of that, you know, on, 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 on their shoulders. But guess what? It is. Because we are a very young community. The median age for Latinos is, I think, 29 years old. For mainstream America, it's in the 50s. So, you know, that just goes to tell you every 30 seconds a Latina turns 18. That means that we are adding 1 million Latinos to the, to the voters, um, to, to the voting um, uh, lists. So, you know, I do think that we are the future. And, and I think it's very, very important that, that we prepare this generation for the future. And to be honest with you, I'm not really worried about this generation because I am in awe of the young generation. I think that sometimes we feel that they are disconnected because they're always connected to their phones. But on the contrary, I think they're very connected. I don't remember a generation that has been so focused on, 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 on social issues and, and understanding and being active in, 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 in taking a stand on, on issues and, you know, giving importance to higher education, giving importance to climate change, giving importance to so many issues that affect our planet. So, you know, I think that we have grown <laughs> to answer your question in a very long way. And, and we're really making an impact in all aspects of, of American life. I would like to talk about education because uh, you have actively worked to bridge the higher education gap for Hispanic American students in the U.S., uh, the day, a decade before you were born, Mexicans and Mexican-Americans were still segregated from public schools in the United States, especially in the Southwest. Uh, 
when you were studying journalism at UCLA, you were part of the 4% of Hispanic Americans that enroll, uh, that were enrolled at a college at the time. Today, around 22% of college students are Hispanic Americans. Why this uh, focus area has been so important to you and why improving the education rates of Hispanic Americans, it's important for the broader society. Right. It's important to me as a member of this society. It's important to me as someone in the media that knows that if I have a platform, I should use it for the greater good. But more importantly, it's important to Latino families. I think that Latino parents have given education so much importance and focus because a lot of them have struggled. A lot of them want something different for, for their for their children and grandchildren. They know that the only way to get ahead and the only way to end that vicious cycle of, of poverty and being marginalized is through education. That's why, to me, it's very important. You know, you mentioned uh, the... Um, uh, the registration in, in universities, the enrollment in universities. But I remember that when, when I started in the media, the, one of the main concerns was a very high level of, of high school dropouts in, among the Latino community. I mean, they were almost 40%. That's a lot. Right now, high school dropouts in the Latino community is under 10%. So there is a consciousness uh, that has been created not only by Latino leaders in the country um, and, and influencers, but in Latinos' families the importance of education. I'm on the board of the Hispanic Scholarship Fund, and I have been for the past 15 years. And, and I, I really, like I said before, I'm in awe of the students and the scholars that, that come to us, and, and not only for scholarships, but also for guidance, uh, career guidance. And you have some, some of the brightest students out there um, that, you know, th that are willing to go out and fight and do whatever it takes not only to, to, to improve their own careers, but to give back. I think that spirit of giving back to your community also exists in the Latino community. I also have a scholarship myself uh, for young journalists through the National Association of Hispanic Journalists that I have been providing for about 22 years now um, because I believe in them, you know, and in the beginning it was for those who want to enter Spanish language media. Now it's really uh, for Latinos who want to enter in any media outlet. I've always thought, you know, it's not much. It's not going to pay for, you know, four years of college. But whatever you can do to help, no matter how small it is, poner tu granito de arena to help and influence someone and help them, you know, it, as it is, it's complicated. The whole college process is complicated for high schoolers. I mean, I should know. I have two daughters that are in their 20s. And, and my God, that junior and senior year is like, so much tension, so much stress for them. So why, if, if we can do something to make money not be an issue or be less of an issue, why not? Now, there's so many scholarships out there. There's so much money out there uh, that has been um, allotted for, for scholarships, yet people don't have that information. So I think it's important that we provide that information so that they access those opportunities for, for our young people. A Pew Research Center study showed that in 2018, 77% of newsroom employees in the United States were white and 61% were male. Why is ethnic and gender diversity important in the newsroom? And what would you say to young uh, Hispanic Americans who are considering a career in, in journalism but might be discouraged by these numbers? I think it's very important. It's very important to have minority voices and, and people of color uh, in, in newsrooms because you want to reflect what America is and who America is. Now, I think there has been, you know, an improvement. There has been maybe an increase in, in, in people of color. There's been sort of like an awakening in the media uh, of, of understanding the importance of having, um, you know, more minorities. So yes, more African-Americans uh, appear in television, more Latinos appear in television. You see more bylines in newspapers uh, by, by, by minorities, but, one thing that I think is still missing is our voices, because it's not the same thing to have a face and a name and say, yes, look, look, how, look at our, our diversity. Look at just how many, you know, people of color we have in our staff. I think what you need to do is, is, is allow voices and perspectives from these different communities. I think that's what's missing. And, you know, that's part of my new mission uh, to sort of like press, you know, I, I have been gone from Univision for almost four years now, four years now, 
And, uh, and to me, I think it's very important uh, to have our stories told in mainstream media because uh, Latino stories are American stories. And I really want to change the narrative and change that perception out there that we are foreigners because we're not foreigners. We're very much a part of the fabric of this society and we have a big impact in this society. So not only do we want to see ourselves reflected in the media, but we want our stories to be told accurately so that mainstream America, those who maybe might not know us and are not our neighbors and don't really um, you know, blend too much with, with, with other ethnic groups will understand who we are, what our issues are, what our contributions are, the heroes and heroes that we have in our community. Uh, speaking about your journalism and your time at Univision, uh, for over three decades, you were the co-anchor of Univision's Noticiero Univision in Aquí Ahora, and you have received many prestigious recognitions for your outstanding career in journalism, including five national, national one regional Emmy Awards. Uh, does being a leading female Hispanic American journalist comes with extra challenges? Um, I think that, and thank you very much. That, you know, it's an honor that you say that. I don't know that I consider myself leading, but I, I can say that, I, that that there has been visibility out there. I mean, I was almost 37 years uh, with Univision, and you know, people watch you day in and day out. They become part of your family. So more than anything else, I think. What I feel is a, a huge responsibility um, to not just represent them, but to make sure that they have, you know, accurate information. So I've always taken my my role and my job very seriously. You know, I, I understand that it's, uh, you know, I'm not an entertainer. I'm not a, uh, you know, a TV personality. I'm a journalist. And uh, at this point in my career, I think I I have become... Uh, somewhat of a role model for younger journalists, for example. And, and I say that because, you know, it, it's to my great satisfaction and, 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 and it's humbling when I hear young uh, journalists tell me, Latino journalists tell me, you know, I followed my career because of you. I, you know, I was inspired by you to, to, to enter this field. So it does come with a lot of, of responsibility. You have to take that responsibility very seriously. And, um, you know, and, and give back to, to your community, which is what I try to do every single day. And I try to tell the Latino story. You know, as long as I have a voice, I'm going to continue telling the Latino story and speaking out on behalf of my community, no matter how big or how small the forum is. Thank you for that. And we have just time for one last question. And uh, I, I want to ask you, uh, do you have any book recommendations for those who want to learn more about Hispanic history and culture? Well, there's a lot. Well, any book? Well, there's so many books. I mean, right now, Latino authors are 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 thriving. There is so many different kinds of books, whether it's novels, whether it's it, you know, I, I've been talking a lot with my friend Maria Inojosa and my friend and colleague, as you know, who wrote uh, uh, "Once I Was You," and and we talk about that all the time about so many stories. It's her story, but it's also the story of immigration. Right. And, and and the difficulties that she went through that so many other people go through. And, and, and that's just one of so many books that are out there that whether they're novels and you and you really get to appreciate the talent of, of, of these Latino authors or you want to learn more about about our history. Um, you know, there's a lot out there and, and you just have to Google them and look and see which one coincides with you. And, and, and it's so easy now to hear the Latino story. Not only do you have to get a book, pick it up and read it, which is the best thing that you can do, but you can put your AirPods on and, and listen to it because now most of them are in audiobooks. So there's really no excuse for us um, to, to be treated as, uh, to be reintroduced to, you know, every year during Hispanic Heritage Month. And, and try to figure out who we are or be rediscovered every four years when election time comes around and politicians want our vote. And that's when they come to us and, and they try to, 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 you know, to romance us for, for lack of a, of a better word. Um, just understand, look around you. You know, America is a multi-ethnic, multicultural society, a multilingual society also. And, and, and I think we should all get to know our neighbors, you know? We're all humans, and we come in different colors, and we have different accents, and we have different textures of hair. And uh, or at the end of the day, we're all Americans, even if we're hyphenated Americans. We're Americans. 
Marilena, many, many thanks for taking the time to speak uh, with us on behalf of the Wilson Center. Many, many thanks. Uh, happy Hispanic Heritage Month to you. Likewise, Oscar. Feliz mes de la herencia hispana. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Un abrazo.